That's Burrowing. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Noam Broussard from Protantex. We're going to talk today about power reduction in data centers. Noam, as we start looking at data centers, they're consuming more and more power. Uh, think about things like Chat uh, GPT, GPT four. Those are massively compute intensive types of operations. We used to think about this in terms of uh, blockchain, but this is even much, much more power that we're going to need. And it's not just at the a hyperscale center, uh, data center level. It's also at the edge. It's in uh, inside of corporate data centers. What are people doing now and how do they solve the problem going forward to get down to the point where they are not consuming as much power or running these as efficiently as possible? These applications are, are drawing huge amounts of power and exponentially rising. Therefore, the first thing we have to address, address is the cost efficiency. Efficient power consumption will eventually translate into significant savings in the data centers. So that's number one. Aside from that, we all also have the environmental impact. So beyond financial considerations, power optimization aligns with environmental sustainability goals. That's important too. We want to also be able to, perhaps if we save power, maybe not many people think about it, but we want to extend the lifetime of the electronics. Let's take a closer look. Sure. What are we looking at? Yeah, so like I said, there are many different issues that are affected by high power consumption data centers. And I think the main ones that we can concentrate, the main ones that anyone in the data center sector is talking about are is the limited power budget per rack. So servers, servers currently run at suboptimal capacity. Their utilization is very, very low. But also another major issue you see all over the place is the cooling limitations. The high power requires more cooling. And cooling is becoming a dominant factor in limiting our, the data center's progress. And thermal can destroy chips, right? The more processing you're doing, the higher the compute density, the higher the thermal density as well. Exactly right. That's, uh, that's where cooling comes into play, and that's why it's so critical. We've been dealing with power inside of data centers for quite some time. What else is left? What other knobs are there to turn? Well, one of the ways to address the power consumption is going straight to the main consumer of the power, which are the advanced semiconductors. There are many different methodologies and best practices in place, and each one of them attempts to reduce the amount of voltage power, the chip per its performance target. So basically, if we take a step back, the objective is to get the most performance for the least amount of power, or in other terms, run the chip at the highest frequency possible, but by providing the lowest voltage that will provide will support that frequency. The different methods out there are like DVFS or AVS, whereas they wherein they try to customize the VF pair according to the workload, but none of them really touch upon the core of the problem. And one of the challenges for all those techniques that you were just talking about is they're pretty hard to implement. You don't, this is not the kind of thing you do and just willy nilly say, oh, we're going to add this into the chip. It takes a lot of expertise in order to do this. And we've had other techniques that have been on the, the back burner for a long time, things like near threshold computing as well, that have never actually made it for that reason, right? Many of the best known practices require extensive characterization in the lab in order to ensure once the chip is in the field, that it doesn't exceed its spec. But still, there is a level of uncertainty. For instance, if we take an example, a temperature sensor, we will characterize the chip running in the lab under certain temperatures. In the field, we'll have that temperature sensor sensing when the chip is running over a certain temperature, and then perhaps uh, mitigate the problem when it crosses a certain thre uh, threshold. This is uh, an approximate way of uh, ensuring the chip will run properly in the field. But still, like you said, there's a lot of characterization effort going into this method, and it is not very accurate. It's more of a upper limit of the operation of the chip. And in the past, people used to deal with this by one of two ways, one of which is they add extra circuitry, which is guard banding. Uh, as you get down into the advanced node chips, so though, that, that guard banding has a price to it in terms of performance and power. The second thing they would do is reduce the utilization of the server itself this is where things like virtualization came in for a long time because they wanted to get beyond the 5 to 15% uh, utilization that a lot of these servers are running at. But what we're dealing with now is very intensive workloads. We really need to fine tune a lot of this stuff. How do we do that? Okay, so a lot of that thing has been done, but here's really what comes next. 
when we characterize a chip that comes off the production line, then basically we look for its lowest voltage that will be able to power the target frequency. But since we know that in the field, there are many other things are going to happen that will degrade that performance, we have to bake in voltage guard bands. And this is a necessity. So we know that there will be noise. We know that there will be excessive workloads. We know that the chip will go through aging. All these factors cause us to give more voltage, a supply chip with more voltage than necessary in its best case VDD min. You can see on the left in case A, all the different margins that are baked in. The best case VDD min will be the lower bar there on the left. And, but in fact, what we're gonna apply is the higher voltage, which is there to take into account all the different degrading factors that will happen in the field. The point is, and this is where we can squeeze that extra power savings that is not possible with other methods, is that this uh, combination of guard band factors never really happen together. They're, they're guard band on top of guard band. And if you look at case B and C, in any, in any scenario, in every time, in any point in time, you'll need a different combination of guard bands, but not all of them. So in case B, you'll need only some guard band against the fact that the chip went through some aging and there's a very high workload and there's some noise over there. And in case C, there'll be a different combination. You can see, and in, in case D, as a special case, none of these guard bands are needed because it's a spanking new chip off the press that hasn't experienced any aging or process. It's a very fast process. There's uh, no extreme workloads. And yet you can see in case B, C, and D that despite the fact that we need lower voltages, we're still always applying the higher voltage just in case. In other words, we're, we're paying an insurance policy from day one where really it doesn't come into play until maybe later in life and under certain circumstances. Over time, there are the applied voltage is much higher than the required voltage, which is that green line. The combination of, of all the factors that might require more voltage than VD min is uh, changing all the time, given different temperatures, different timelines, different noise factors, different workloads, but rarely does it reach that applied voltage, which is really there to accommodate the worst case scenario. Everything in between, all the blue lines over there is just wasted power. It's what we call margin that could have been used for either saving power or conversely, working at that higher voltage, but then squeezing more performance out of it. There's a fundamental change that's gone on here, though, which is that in the past, you basically had a chip and you you knew what the parameters were for using that chip. So you you understood all the the impacts and all the characterization and, and you know, oh, we can run it at this this temperature, we can run it at this speed. If we have to dial it back, that's fine. What's changed now is that a lot of these are very domain-specific designs and even beyond that, they're now workload-specific designs. How does this play into that? Right, excellent question. So exactly right. Uh, by by looking at the limiting factor itself, is what, which is what we do, and we'll talk about that in a sec, we don't really care what domain this is in. If it's a, the data center or if it's AI chip, we're really looking at the limiting factor, which are which is the delay of a path and how close it is to timing failure. The reason that it's close to timing failure may be temperature, workload, it may be noise, it may be aging. It's not really important to us. We're not looking at the contributing factors, but at the effect on the path itself. So to answer your question, we're not really sensitive to the specific application because we're looking at the electronics themselves. What happens when you reduce that those margins? Obviously, they were in there for a good reason. Right. So, so obviously, you can't reduce margins without uh, the responsibility of making sure that you don't fail because those margins are in place, those safeguards are in place, so you do not fail. So what we do in Protantics is we have uh, two different features uh, that are provided by our IP. Number one, thou shall do no harm, that's the obvious one. Even if you don't reduce the margin uh, or the voltage, which will reduce the margin, we always provide you a safety net. No matter how big or small the margin is, if an event happens in which the voltage is not enough to power the, 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 the given performance frequency, then we will give an interrupt. You can see this over here and act quickly and increase the voltage back to a safety, uh, safe value. Now, 
if we have that capability, now we can do some interesting things with this margin that I spoke about. So you're running at a very high voltage, but you only need a lower voltage using our AVS Pro application. We'll see how far that uh, margin is from failure on the timing paths at a very, very high coverage over the chip. As soon as we see that there is a significant amount of margin, we'll start reducing the voltage. The effect will be that the margins will get smaller and smaller until we'll be closer to timing failure. We won't get there. We have this minimum um, allowed timing margin over here. When we see the timing margin approaches this limit, we'll, we'll tell the voltage to stop and we'll allow the chip to run at this significantly lower voltage all the time checking there's no event that makes the, these safeguards that we spoke before necessary. So for instance, if there's a voltage droop suddenly, or if there is a, a, a latent defect that happens, we can identify the, the falling margin because of that event and immediately within a few cycles, tell the voltage to go back up and there, therefore become safe again. So that's our reducing power with safety net in order to mitigate that fear of losing that margin. And what you've done to a large extent is basically said, okay, you're, you're not dealing with margin as a fixed number. You're dealing with it almost in real time of this amount of margin needs to be added. Exactly, exactly right. No longer uh, we take worst case scenarios and this is what best practices usually do. They say, okay, there's uh, not a, a lot of aging right now. We'll reduce the power a little bit. But later on, we'll check if there's some aging. We'll just give it a little bit more power. We are application aware and workload aware. So whatever the case may be, whatever the amount of aging that happened at this point in time, whatever the application you're running, if it's intense, you'll have less margin. If it's a little bit more lax, you'll have more margin. We will know how to reduce the, the voltage to that point, which you can still provide the application without uh, fear of failure. And we're used to thinking about margin in terms of a chip, but really what you're doing is changing the margin for the entire data center now, right? Because if you can increase the utilization by 10, 15% or more, then you basically say, okay, we don't need this. We don't need as many machines as, as we needed before. We can run these things uh, harder than what we were doing in the past. And we can run them potentially up to a point where they, they don't overheat. And we know exactly what that is in real time. Right. There, there, there are many, many benefits of running at a lower voltage. Let me just give you some kind of idea. These are real life uh, application running on real uh, products. Uh, by uh, reducing the power, you can hear, see here on the left, this gray line is the applied voltage of this product before the AVS Pro or Protantix was uh, enabled. As soon as it was enabled, we dropped the power down to this line over here. And in this particular case, we save 12.8% of the power. And this is, uh, we've seen across our customers savings between nine and 14% of the power. Just to, to wrap up what I explained previously, here you can see a case where there was a need for exactly those guard bands that we, we did without when we went, went down over here. Then over here, there was a case on the right where there was an event, perhaps a voltage droop that required us to raise the power and the reaction was within a few cycles back up to the nominal power. And when you talk about that power reduction, and there's more to it than just that one number, right? Because you've got less data movement. Mo data movement takes a fair amount of power by itself. You also have fewer machines to power and cool as well. So you've got this bigger picture that magnifies. So that 9 to 14% may be significantly larger than what you're talking about. So indeed, if you take this number per chip and you multiply it, then we've seen staggering numbers. So uh, at one case study that we've done on GPUs, if we take a GPU, uh, the, data, the GPUs in the data center, we assume the power consumption of 0 0.35 kilowatt hour with a utilization rate of 60% and a power usage effectiveness, which is a, a common number in the industry of 1.3. So we get a total power per GPU of 0 0.273. Uh, if you take 500,000 GPUs and an electricity cost of about um, 0 0.10 kilowatts per hour, then your annual annual power total cost comes to around one, just a bit under $120 million. The proteantics impact will be by, by this, let's say, let's just take a 10% power savings per GPU will be uh, equated to an annual savings of about $12 million per year. And that's, that's, that's huge. So if you take that one small number, 
multiply it by those uh, amount of GPUs, it's a huge amount of number. And then you add in things like we, it doesn't age as quickly because you're now under tighter control and you also don't need as much real estate because your machines are running at higher utilization as well. Right. I think that's a, a very important point. Once, if we, if we keep in mind that what we're doing is we're looking at the margins, the unused margins, then it's really, it becomes up to you as a user, how do you want to utilize them? One way would be to lower power. One of the effects of lowering power would be extending lifetime of, of the machines as well. So that's a, a big thing in the data center industry that uh, they're trying to extend the lifetime of their, their machines, basically trying to bump up the, uh, it, the time between replacement of electronics from three to four years to some, something on the order of four to six years. And one excellent way of doing that is reducing the constant power that this chip is working over, over those years. So that's one way you could use it. But other industries, and we have customers that say, you know, uh, what, what really earns us money is performance. We'll, we'll, we'll foot the bill. And looking at that same margin, now we showed an application of reducing power, which saves you money on electricity costs, cooling costs, and extending and it on the way also extends your lifetime. But these customers will say, I want more operations, per se, want more tera operations per second, for instance. And that's okay because you're working at such a high voltage, a high voltage compared to what you really, really need. And therefore, since you're at that high voltage, you can also get more performance for your per milliwatt. So what does this mean for a data center long-term? Uh, what's the impact here? Yeah, so I think, first of all, uh, this, uh, I think what we're doing now is the way for to the future. So I think uh, uh, five, six years down the road, everyone's going to be doing exactly this. We're really struggling to say to save every single milliwatt. And uh, the way to do it is to be extremely low margin and uh, therefore not waste one milliwatt on overheads. Uh, now, what is the implications moving forward? We mentioned many of them. It'll allow the expansion of more electronics, high-end electronics per rack at a lower cost. It'll allow longer time between, uh, uh, between replacing electronics, higher-end TTF, uh, it'll, it'll also allow to conversely boost the amount of performance you get per each rack. All these will be are now considered luxuries, but it's something that we believe at Potantix will become a necessity. Noam Broussard, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much, Ed.